Okay, so how many of you have heard of the American poet Robert Frost? Yeah. Robert Frost is um, probably one of the most recognized popular poets in American poetry. Uh, he also is kind of nice <clears throat> to study in the sense that he doesn't get real abstract. This is about as abstract as he gets. This is about as tough as his poetry gets. Um, most of his poems are really exploring what it means to be human, um, the human condition, what's the meaning of life, that sort of thing. So, let's start by reading it together. And by reading it together, I'll read it. You don't have to read it with me. Um, but think about what fire might stand for symbolically and what ice might stand for, because they are, he is using them symbolically as well as a little bit literally um, in addition. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I would hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice all, is also great and would suffice. So what is our general topic? What is our surface topic? The end of the world. Yeah. The end of the world. Um, and the debate about how the world will end. Eventually our planet will end, right? The existence of our planet will end. Um, are we just talking about the planet, though, when we say world? No. We're probably talking... We're ta we could be talking literally... Literally, well, that would be part of the literal world, the universe. Um, but what else besides the physical planet? People. Yeah. And by people, you mean society, humanity, right? Humanity. How will the world of humans end? Everything ends. So, the human world. Physical planet and humanity. Humanity may end before the physical world. Some days it seems really possible, right? So, fire. What might be the literal ending of the world of the planet by fire. That would not end the planet, would it? Yeah, but we're most likely to end humanity. But I ask about the literal planet. Oh, it's so like a meteor. Maybe if it's big enough. Big enough, yeah. Because then we can move in. Millions of years from now, it would probably be the sun when it. Yeah. Yeah, the sun when it expands and dies. And it swallows and, and grows and swallows up the planet. So there's that scientific ending to the world in fire. Then for the physical planet, but for humanity, might be nuclear violence. nuclear war, our own violence. Um, in that sense, some say it will end in ice. So another ice age could be. Um, you know, some of the theories about how the planet will end is that it will survive the sun expanding. And when the sun goes back down, it will still be there. But then it will be cold, become a cold, dead cinder. So that would be an end to it. What about humanity? Well... Let's, let's not talk about so much that, but how might humanity's world end in ice? It's kind of the same answer, possibly. Um, so, like, to my other answer of fire, or to nuclear the winter. ice age? Huh? Nuclear winter. Nuclear winter. Mm. We already know from the detonation of test bombs and that, that one bomb going off in the atmosphere changes the whole atmosphere. 
system. I mean, it can be detected in the whole atmosphere. And it even, if it's detonated in the air, they did a couple of detonations in space and they, they wiped out the uh, magnetic protection at one point, the ionosphere. And it was gone for like two days. It's, luckily, there wasn't a, a sunstorm, but. That's not good. Yeah. And. And so these weapons, it is predicted, they throw so much dust up in the air in that, that in fact, after the nuclear war, you would have a nuclear winter, a nuclear ice age. So anybody that survived would just die because it got too cold. Might freeze to death and start. Or start. Uh, or start. Yeah. So there's two endings to the world, right? Now, who is the sum? What kind? Of, what what groups of people talk about the different endings of the world? We talk about two different. Scientists. Okay, scientists talk about the physical end, uh, ending. All right, science. I don't even know what I'm writing there. Just write sci. Who else talks about the end of the world? Philosophers. What kind of philosophers? Might be conspiracy theorists. Yeah, we'll go with that. Theorists. Religions. Almost every religion has an end of the world um, idea, right? So this sum is actually quite a few people, but. We're, we're discussing this, and they disagree. They don't all agree on how the world will end. Now, Robert Frost is sort of setting us up. Let me delete some of that stuff. He is, he is setting us up for his kind of take on this. He is commenting on what he believes. So he set up a premise here, an argument. This is what I'm talking about. Then he goes on to his opinion. How do we know? Because we have a little stanza break here. It's hard to tell on this, but this is a stanza. And then you have a little stanza break here. How do we know that we've switched to his opinion? Well, what I've tasted. He's talking to first person. First person. I've tasted a desire. I hold. That's the first twice. I think. I know. Yeah. It is his personal opinion. And... He says, from what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. Wait, what? Desire? What does desire got to do with this? First of all, why would desire, the word desire, make him favor fire? Or say it's going to end in fire? Think about what you know about the associations we make with the word desire. There's an emotional connotation, isn't there? Connotation, emotional. How do we, use, what kind of words do we use to describe somebody's passion or their desires? What kind of adjectives do we use? That's not an adjective. <laughs> No, it's an out, but what kind of love? Um, happy. Okay, we got an adjective, yeah. Somebody else? Plus. What, okay, you, okay, let's say, let's go with plus. What was the love? Okay. What kinds of adjectives besides? Uh, temperature. Don't we use temperature? What kind of temperature adjectives do we use for desire? What are temperature adjectives? Old, hot, burning. You never heard the phrase burning passion? Burning desire? Yeah. On fire. <clears throat> With desire. You know it, but making you connect. Making the connection is a little tough. I get that. We use, we use for the word desire, and it doesn't have to be passion. 
you have, you may have, I have a desire for a new vehicle. Right? I've spent $3,000 on my car in the last four months. I'm not happy. But I'm not quite ready to buy a new one. I have a very strong desire to buy a new one right now. I'm, I'm tired of it. Right? Strong desire. I'm burning! For me, at least. Me too. Oh, yes, let's go. Yeah, yeah. A burning desire for a new vehicle! Right? I'm speaking in terms of heat. Desire is spoken of in terms of heat. Right? You know this, you just haven't thought about it before, and that's okay. So, what is he saying here? He's making a comment about human passions, human wants, human desires. And what is he saying about that, human desires? His <laughs> Sure. What happens when any of us, y'all with me? Some of you aren't. I'm not sure if you're, you're, you're with me. I just are looking at other things. What happens when we want stuff too much? We get mad, we melt down, push it away. Yes, if you if you want to date somebody too much, you're going to stay away. They're going to run away, right? They're going to think you're psycho and run away. If you desire physical objects, cars and boats and houses and, and your, your lust for all of those things, you're going to destroy your life. It will destroy you because you'll never be happy, right? And you'll end up destroying yourself or you'll get frustrated when you can't get it all self-destruct, melt down. So, he's saying human desire when out of control is harmful, not only to yourself, but to those around you, right? All right, so he's linking, he's reminding us that desire is associated with heat. He's starting to link human human emotions, human human behavior with these temperature sort of things, fire and ice. So, then we go to, but if it had to perish twice, he has a shift here. That's a, that's a literary term I did not give you, and I, I keep meaning to give students every year. Shift. A shift is any time in a piece of poetry or a short story or something where there's a change in logic or a, 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 a shift to the next point. Maybe a change in mood. That really sounded like a hurt. Um, but if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great. Okay, what? I'm going to try this again. Let's see if you Don't feel bad because I get why you didn't catch it. What temperature adjectives do we associate with hate? Cold. 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 Chilling. Icy. Yes. If you get in trouble with your, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, they might give you the cold shoulder. Right? Sometimes we talk about people before their wedding getting cold feet. It's a negative, right? If you hate somebody, you have a very cold stare. We use those temperatures to describe connotatively for the emotion of hate. Hate. And it's the exact opposite. If you love love is fire, hate is ice. They're they're diametrically opposed. So what does he say about hate? That it relates to us. Yes, that it relates to us, but that it's just as destructive, right? Just as destructive as too much passion. If you have too much hate, 
You're going to ruin your life. You're going to ruin other people's lives. Right? You can, you can ruin your life with too much hate as much as you can with too much desire. Right? So he's saying both. Both of these things are capable of destroying the world. Now, you can speak on multiple levels with the world. We talked about physical and, and humanity, but you can also link it down to individual lives. Because face it, if you're destroyed, you no longer, your world ends, right? When we, when we move on from this life, our world has ended. Is those things going to be the things that destroy us when they get too out of control? So, he's talking about, when it, he's starting with the end of the world, but he's really talking about our individual lives, about how we, if we let these things get too strong of a hold on us, they can destroy our world. Now, the other thing I want to discuss, um, rhyme scheme. You all learned rhyme scheme before, but some of you don't remember it, and some of you do. But rhyme scheme is the labeling of in rhyme. Sometimes you'll see rhyme with in a line, that's called internal. But when we do when we do uh, rhyme scheme labeling, it's always about end rhyme. And so what you do with that is look at the last word. Now, line one, does anybody know what that's labeled? It's labeled alphabetically. A. A. Line one is always A. If you don't know anything, line one is always A. It can't be anything else. You got to start with A. The next one is B. Why? Because ice and fire don't end. Oh, sorry. Now, fire and ice are not a straight rhyme. They're not a perfect rhyme. And they are not a bend. bent rhyme. You can't manipulate the words and change how you pronounce them to make them fit. So that's got to be B. That's A. That's A, right? Fire, desire. That's a perfect rhyme. They share the same vowel, and they share the same ending consonant. So, that's A. A. Fire, A. B. Twice, Y, B. Ice is in the work of display. Yeah. And it makes that I, and then the S sound of the C. Hate. C. Y, C. Does it match A or B? Hate twice, hate fire. And and it's kind of interesting here. You don't have to look at every line if you have A, B, A, A, B. If this doesn't rhyme with either of these two because it's B and A here, you don't have to go any further. You know it's got to be the next thing down the alphabet. Hate. B. Ice is B because ice rhymes with twice and ice, ice words always rhyme with themselves. C. Because great and hate. Great and hate. It's a bent rhyme. No, it's the same. It's a perfect rhyme. I thought it had an M with the same consonant to be a perfect. It had, but this is a silent E. Okay. Right. Yeah. We're talking about sound, not letters on the page. It's all about sound. Great and hate. And then suffices. Technically, you could spell hate H E A T, but we don't. Because that's heat, right? And then suffice. That's ice. So that's great. ice. So I'm mean, sorry, I didn't ever do this one, right? Great yeah, see. and yeah, hate. Yeah, that'd be. Suffice and ice. So it's A B A A B C B C B. Yes, it is. Um, and that's rhyme scheme. Now I want you to understand something here, guys, because this is where students sometimes get confused. We have basically one stanza here. What happens when you go across stanzas? What do you mean? Like, like if this were a separate stanza, remember stanzas or what? What did I say they were? They're paragraphs in poetry. So let's say that, uh, that, that Frost had actually a break here. It would be a different... I thought that, that was, those were stanzas. They are. Be a separate stanza. Yeah, so how does that affect this? It's not the same rhyme scheme, is it? It's a different rhyme scheme. That's the thing that concerns me, guys. Pay attention. 
it doesn't matter where stanzas begin or end. Rhyme scheme ignores the beginning and ends of stanzas. Okay? You don't start over because it's a new stanza. You continue on. Because rhyme scheme continues on past stanzas, right? Uh, so you don't start over. You go all the way through the whole work. So don't think, oh, well, this has got to be, this has got to start over because that's A. And then, no, because then it may not rhyme with that. Doesn't matter whether there's stanza breaks or not. Uh, you go through the whole work with rhyme scheme. You don't do by stanza. That's one time when you ignore stanzas. Questions, comments, criticisms, observations.